So I'm really excited to continue our Florida's Coral Reef webinar series today. A little bit about myself, I am the Awareness and Appreciation Coordinator here at the Coral Reef Conservation Program. And prior to this, I got my PhD at the University of, University of Miami, where I focused on sharks and shark fisheries in South Florida. So I'm really excited to be able to work directly with stakeholders um, and in the governance sphere now. Uh, and I have on tech support, Taylor Tucker, who um, I would love to introduce herself as well. Hi everyone, my name is Taylor and I'm part of our Reef Injury Prevention and Response Program. So I work on mitigating anchor damage to coral reefs and I'm located in our West Palm Beach office in the Southeast District. Super excited for everyone attending today. Um, hope you guys learned a lot. Thank you, Taylor. So a little housekeeping, we do have a bunch of classes coming up. And if any of these sound interesting, please feel free to sign up. They will all be recorded as well. So if you can't catch one, you can always um, catch up afterwards. So they'll all be available on the main um, Florida's Coral Reef Earth Month webinar series webpage. Um, I made a little short link here, um, but we will um, make sure that that is very available for all of you if you want to see things or even just share them with other people. So otherwise for technology, we'll have a couple of polls pop up today and don't worry, they're totally anonymous. So, um, and if you have any questions, you can type them into the Q&A and Taylor will try to get to them. Uh, but if you have any questions more so about the, the content, then uh, you can save those until the end and then raise your hand and then we'll, um, you, can, you can unmute yourself and ask the question then as well. So today we're just going to take a, a nice tour of Florida's coral reef. So going a little bit over coral biology and Florida's coral reef. So what is this particular reef and, and why do we think it's so important? And then we'll go into what our department does um, the Coral Reef Conservation Program, and also what you guys can do to help the reef. So first, I'd love to dive in with this, uh, this video that honestly still gives me chills sometimes. Um, it's a PSA that we put together about two, uh, one or two years ago. Let's see if I can get it to load. Florida's Coral Reef, a living kingdom, a refuge, all of it a gift, and we are its keeper. Yet some coral, once vibrant and colorful, now sits in all the white. But this is not where our story ends. This is Florida's coral reef. We will protect its splendor and mystery. We will keep the preserved the gift we have received, our inheritance, our legacy. Beautiful. All right. So, um, Straight to some definitions. So what is a coral reef? Um, so do you guys think that they're, uh, they're plants or animals? Are they minerals? Um, I have a little poll that I can launch and we'll see um, which of those things that you think that a coral is. So a couple more seconds. All right. Yeah, so you guys um, seem to really know your stuff. I'm not surprised. So a coral reef is, is made up of all these little animals. So it's a living structure made up of those little coral polyps. So those are tiny animals that live together. Oops, something sped ahead. My apologies. In those big colonies. 
and those uh, those colonies um, are come in all different shapes and sizes as well as, as a polyp. So those polyps can be as big as your hand um, to the size of the the head of a pin, essentially. And then when those coral polyps die, they leave behind these. Uh, I have an overactive mouse. I really apologize. Uh, they leave behind there um, these hard skeletons, and that's what makes up the backbone of the reef. And so a coral versus a coral reef is, it's kind of just zooming down, is a, a family of those polyps. So they're essentially genetically, I, most for the most part, identical, and those polyps are connected across that hard skeleton. Right, so those, a coral is basically like a big family or a coral colony. And another important thing about corals is that they live in something called symbiosis. So symbiosis is a relationship where two or more species are living really closely together. Um, and if you're interested in entomology, um, that's where, where that comes from. And what they live in, in symbiosis with is uh, these algae called zooxanthellae. So these zooxanthellae uh, get their energy from the sun. So they live inside these little, um, sorry, over in, these, uh, in, the, in this here in the coral polyp. Uh, and they, so these are um, able to get light from the sun and they are creating energy and then they in turn can provide that to the corals. And then the, the benefit that the zooxanthellae get is that they are then protected from predators. So these things right here uh, are little stinging cells, almost like a little jellyfish. So um, these guys are, are nice and safe. And another cool thing about zooxanthellae is they are the things that give a coral its color. So, you know, these, these Susan Valley right here, you know, in more of a, a brownish yellowish color, so um, a brownish yellowish coral. But that is not the only way that corals can eat. So they can also uh, kind of grab things out of the water as they come by. So the, we call that a filter feeder or a suspension feeder. So little zooplankton, little tiny little animals that come by in the water, they can also feed on those. And again, they use those little stinging cells that they have at their tips there to, um, to draw in that teeny tiny little prey. And so this is a great video where we can see corals doing that feeding. You can watch a little bit of it here. So yeah, you see these little, um, the little polyps kind of wriggling around and this little, um, those little specks of food coming by. Uh, and what is cool is if you're a scuba diver or a snorkeler and you go at night, and if you shine a flashlight on a coral, sometimes you can see this happening uh, really nice and clearly. Awesome. Yeah, so polyps coming in all different shapes and sizes, as we can see here, just gorgeous. So one other important thing to know about corals is they take a really long time to grow. So Florida's coral reef itself um, began forming after the last ice age and, and now it is where it is today. So, and depending on the type of coral, um, some take less time than others, some take more time. So these boulder corals that we have here, so those are the really big, um, the corals that can be like basically the size of a house, those grow, you know, maybe half a centimeter um, to two centimeters a year, which is which is less than an inch, whereas these branching corals right here, uh, like a staghorn, can grow much more quickly. And these are what you often see in a lot of restoration projects, um, and those will kind of um, form a nice little base of a reef while other corals are growing. And then another term I just want to share with you guys is this idea of reef resilience. So resilience means that something, um, even though it's stressed and something happens to it, it's able to bounce back because of this um, inherent uh, resilience that it has. So this inherent strength, or in, in the case of coral reefs, maybe it has biodiversity in it. So um, just because a bleaching happens, for example, or because a, a hurricane happens, because that reef is resilient, so it has, for example, a lot of genetic diversity, it has a lot of different species, um, it's able to still come back and, you know, be a reef after that impact. 
So in terms of where corals are found, uh, it's in a lot of places. So um, some are warmer, some are cooler. And uh, a really interesting thing about corals and you know how they get to be what they are is that they can't move, right? So um, we call that sessile, for example. So they're tied to one place for their entire life, right? If you're a coral polyp. So they have to be suited to where they are. So in each of these locations, they all have different environmental conditions, um, different predators. So they all have their, their unique differences because they are suited to that, you know, that one spot on the ocean floor. And even in the United States, we have quite a few coral reefs that are in our, our, our country and also in our territories. But we're just going to focus back in on Florida. So I'm going to put out another poll. How long do you think Florida's coral reef is? So it looks like, um, again, you guys seem to know your stuff. So most of you knew that it was uh, 350 miles long. So that stretches all along Monroe County here, which is the Keys, um, up towards Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, and Martin counties. So these, these counties are home to more than 6 million people. And then in addition to that, we have 38 million visitors who come every year. So that's quite a few people. And depending on where you are in Florida and the Keys, you can be farther or closer to the reef. So in the Florida Keys um, down here, sometimes um, for these kind of for these outer reefs, you have to take a boat. Like it's a couple of miles offshore to be able to see it. Whereas up here, closer to uh, Fort Lauderdale, for example, to West Palm Beach, the reefs are super close to shore, so you can snorkel and swim out to the reefs pretty easily. So this is one of those interesting trade-offs. So it makes it this reef really unique. You know, we have this massive reef, um, one of the largest in the world, and it's also the one that's the closest to this big population. So on the one hand, it's incredible that people can experience it so easily and go out to see it, but on the other hand, we have to be really careful about how our everyday activities are impacting that reef because it's so close to us. So let's take a look under the wave. So what does our reef tend to look like? So um, kind of going out, and this is in the more the Miami, um, Fort Lauderdale area, the Keys are a little bit farther offshore. Typically we have, um, our inner reef, our mid reef, and our outer reef. So closer to shore, um, even further shore than the inner reef, we might have some patch reefs. Um, then as you as you go deeper, you have a couple different sections. And you know, apart from that, you might have um, some corals out of colonized rocks, for example, or little artificial reefs. But these are the three main natural reef areas that we have. They're all pretty close to shore. So in terms of what makes up the structure of those reefs, the first thing is these stony corals. So this is what I was speaking about earlier. So these are those, um, those hard reef building corals and their polyps will leave behind these really dense networks of hard skeletons. So here's a little QR code if you wanna learn more about IDing corals, but Taylor will be teaching our coral ID classes on the 21st and 28th of this month. So you can check them out then. So again, these guys create a massive habitat over thousands of years. And the next thing that we have is our sponges. So sponges are pretty incredible. So of course they have you know, a ton of species here, more than corals even. Um, and they also have a lot to do with water quality. So you can imagine that, you know, if you have a, a sponge that you use at home for cleaning, like a lot of water is um, goes through it, but they, 
they filter water, they collect bacteria, they process carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. So they're really, really important, um, not just in terms of providing habitat, but also in terms of maintaining the water quality of the reef. And you can learn more about these guys on our in our invertebrate classes. So one happened on the 5th, and we have another one happening on the 12th of this month. And lastly, we have these soft corals. So for instance, like these sea fans here. So these are still corals, even though they don't have that hard uh, skeleton-like structure. They look more like a tree or a bush when they're underwater. You'll see them kind of waving around. And they also grow more quickly than a stony coral does. So they can really build up that structure of a reef, um, even if they aren't you know, accreting and building stuff over time. And when we think about uh, going back to that idea of reef resilience, if something happens specifically to the stony corals, like if there's a specific um, disease, for example, or like an environmental stressor that affects those stony corals, those soft corals, there's so many species of them, and same with the sponges, there's a chance that they won't be affected. So they can maintain that the, the functionality of the reef and still providing habitat um, for, for all these fish and so on. So that's when you have these soft corals and these sponges, that's really increasing the ability of the reef to, to bounce back and be resilient. So uh, I want to go a little bit more into why it's uh, it's so important to, to have these reef around, reefs around. So that's for, for us and for animals as well. So first of all, um, as I'm sure anyone can attest to who lives in South Florida, the reefs are really essential to our way of life. And so here we have a couple numbers. So, you know, more than 71,000 jobs, more than 6 billion in sales and income in those counties that are next to the reef. But apart from that, um, I think that there's, there's a lot more. So in Florida, you might have like a sense of pride that, you know, this reef is a part of where you live and is a part of your way of life. Um, and if you're a fisher, then that's it's, or if you're a diver or a dive instructor, your your livelihood or even like your mental health can be really tied to having that healthy reef. Um, so yeah, it's more than just the numbers. This reef is is very essential to who we are as South Floridians. And then another really important thing is that these coral reefs are protecting us from storms. So a healthy coral reef can protect up to 97% of wave energy. And that, you know, again, you can put a lot of numbers on that, um, but I think that a really powerful image is that, um, so after Hurricane Irma in 2018, scientists found all throughout the reef that were these, these areas of the reef that were essentially like uplifted, fractured, um, corals toppled over all over the place. And so that was from those corals taking the force of the waves. And so the corals took that force from, from that massive hurricane, and then we had that much less that reached us in the Keys and in South Florida. So I think that's a really powerful image. And then, of course, that's not to mention all these fish, for example, that depend on coral reefs, uh, as well as mangroves and um, and seagrass beds that are right close by. So fish will spend their lives, you know, switching between all of these different habitats, depending on what life stage they are. And then um, once they grow up, once they mature, they will come, <laughs> my bad. They'll come back to those reefs um, as healthier fish and then essentially build up that population. So coral reefs are really important for not only the, um, the fish populations in coral reefs, but also in these other habitats as well. So adding all of those things up, we have more than 70 species of sponges, more than 517 species of fish, more than 600 invertebrates, and more than 43 species of stony corals. So that's a lot of biodiversity that we have here, which is, which is pretty incredible. And so given all of those incredible values, you can see why we want to then put these measures in to protect it. And we do have a couple of policies and regulations around here that can protect the reefs and the services that they provide to us. So on April 26th, we'll talk a bit more in detail 
um, about the, the ins and outs of how we protect the reef with these policies. But essentially, um, all of Florida's coral reef is protected. Um, you are not allowed to take corals. Um, it's, it's not legal to, um, to hurt a coral uh, by anchoring on it, for example. Um, so we do really do what we can to um, encourage people to, to treat corals and their, their ecosystems responsibly. So uh, now I'm going to kind of turn it a little, little less happy um, into some of the stressors that our reefs are facing. So we're going to start off with the big picture, so things that are happening on the global scale. So, of course, uh, with climate change, we have things like more frequent um, extreme weather. So um, things like big storms, for instance, uh, hurricanes can you know, change their dynamics as well. And so that all has an impact on corals. And another sort of extreme weather that you know, affects life in the ocean is a marine heat wave. So just like we have heat waves on land and you know, those have been changing you know, how long they are, how severe they are, that same thing is happening in the ocean. And then we also have ocean warming and ocean acidification. But um, it's important to note, as I'm sure many of you know, that um, when something happens over a longer period of time, an animal may have um, the opportunity to move or to, for it to adapt. But when you have something like a marine heat wave, um, it might not have time to adapt. So um, it, is, it can be a bit more severe. So all of those things can lead to coral stress and coral bleaching. So bleaching just briefly is when um, those algae inside of the corals, um, they, they vacate the coral essentially um, because the conditions are too stressful for it. And the coral can still survive by, by feeding um, on those zooplankton and they can regain their algae if the conditions correct themselves. So kind of zooming in again um, from the global picture, which um, you know, we might not be able to have as much of a direct impact on. Um, we're going to focus a little bit more on stuff that's happening more locally. So uh, we have recreational diving and vessel, vessel anchoring. Um, so these are two things that are a direct physical impact. So, you know, someone touching a, a coral, someone holding onto a coral, someone, um, you know, anchoring while they're diving or fishing and, you know, accidentally having the anchor drop on a coral reef, um, you know, clearly that's not helpful for a coral. And then we also have things like, um, like fishing pressure that, you know, isn't in balance with the ecosystem. We have some invasive species. Um, so then we can affect our fish population, which again is part of the coral reef ecosystem. And then things like coastal construction impacts. So say you're dredging and you release a lot of sediment then that can smother a coral or pollution that comes from land um, when you have, uh, uh, for example, um, sources of, of chemicals in your runoff, then that can go into our canals and our rivers and then go out to the reef. And these are all amplified by the fact that, as I said, we have this really dense population. So our reefs are really close to shore. So it's, you know, it's easy for these stressors to affect those corals. And so, um, it's really important to take kind of a holistic view of these stressors. So if you remove one of them, the rest of them are still there. So we really want to think about how we can work on, you know, all of those things together. And another really important consideration of the reef is that it's connected to this 4 million acre watershed. So that includes um, the Everglades, uh, our big river of, of, of uh, river of glass over here. So um, what happens on land, um, you know, it does eventually flow out to the reef and so it does have an impact. So for instance, fertilizer. Um, so too much of those, of those minerals that might help plants grow on land can also help uh, plants on top of the water grow, so these algae. And so when those algae grow too much, they can smother corals. So those zooxanthellae, those algae inside can't produce their, their energy so that, that sunlight is blocked. And then we can also have um, some fish kills resulting from that uh, as well. So it's you know, a really multifaceted impact when you have a lot of fertilizer. And particularly relevant here in South Florida is that you know, when you have a big rainfall, like we have our wet season coming right up, that's when you'll have these really big pulses of fertilizer going out to the reef. 
Secondly, we have pesticides. Uh, so, you know, if, if you have bugs on your lawn, they don't really want around. Um, that's whether you're a homeowner or you're um, working on, on a farm. Those chemicals can really, well, just as they might disrupt um, the reproductive cycles of the, the insects that you're trying to reduce, they can, um, they can do the same thing to corals. So um, pesticides have been found to be stressful and, and lead to these, these events like coral bleaching. And then another big one that we have here is something called stony coral tissue loss disease. So this began in Miami in, in 2014, uh, just north of Virginia Key, if you're familiar with the area. And then it spread you know, up to a couple hundred meters a day. And it is now, as of last year, spread throughout our entire reef down to the dry tortugas. So this um, is being studied a lot. Um, but it is still, you know, we haven't really pinned down uh, what the origin of that disease is. So essentially, this is what a disease coral looks like. Um, and you can learn more about, you know, how to identify these things and report them um, in our CFAN and Bleach Watch um, classes coming up on the 19th and 26th. So we'll have this, this healthy tissue here. And then this is kind of our little, um, this is where the disease is currently attacking. And then it leaves behind this uh, this bare coral skeleton. And so unfortunately, when stony coral tissue loss disease affects a coral, unless we intervene, then it will inevitably um, entirely die over weeks or months. And um, on, on, the, on the good side, we do have antibiotic paste that we can apply. So you can apply it to kind of these lesion areas right here. And that is really, really successful in stopping a lot of these infections. So for the first couple of years, we didn't have that treatment. Now we do. So um, it's, you know, it's not really a reason for entire doom and gloom, that's for sure. Um, but a good thing to know about this disease in particular and why we kind of pay so much attention to it, you know, just like, um, you know, with human diseases, you'll have this um, endemic background disease for a lot of diseases in coral. So it's, it's very normal to have a certain um, low number of corals in a population have a disease. But when you have stony coral tissue loss disease, um, that number of corals that are diseased in a population can jump up to you know, two thirds to all of the corals. So um, at certain sites, all of the corals are affected and that was really unheard of um, with any other coral disease that we had monitored. But, you know, a good thing is A, that we have that antibiotic paste and we're working on a lot of other treatments, but B, not all corals are affected. So two of our most charismatic species, the staghorn and the alcone coral, are really not susceptible to this disease. You know, some really magnificent species like these big pillar corals are very susceptible, but you know, it's not all equal. So that has been really helpful to find out. So as I alluded to, there is hope. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that we have to work against, but the fact that we're aware of them is, is a great place to start. So our program in particular, I can speak to, so the, the DEP Coral Reef Conservation Program. So we focus on these five key threats to our reefs that uh, were identified through a stakeholder-led process. So I'll go through each of them one by one, but first I just want to start off by saying that we really focus on this area right here. Um, that spans, you know, just from north of Biscayne Bay up to the northern edge of the reef in Martin County. So this is the Kristen Jacobs Coral Reef Ecosystem Conservation Area, uh, formerly known as the, um, the Seth Creek Region or the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Ecosystem Conservation Area. And it was renamed to honor the late Florida Congresswoman who is really dedicated to protecting the Florida environment. So first of all, we have our maritime industry and coastal construction impacts focus area. So this is looking th at things like um, when there is infrastructure that's being installed on the coast, so cables, pipelines, uh, sewage outfalls, when there's things like beach nourishment or beach renourishment, when there's dredge and fill operations, um, really engaging with those stakeholders and the regulatory process there. Next, this is my focus area. So uh, lack of awareness and appreciation. So we have obviously a lot of people who are out and enjoying the benefits that our reef has to offer. So 
this focus area just you know engaging with those stakeholders and letting them know the responsible way to enjoy the reef so we also work with with students so we have um, curricula and activities that go out to students from grades k to 12. we do a lot of public outreach so you might see us in the community next the land-based sources of pollution so uh, for this focus area really focused on water quality sampling um, throughout the coral reef tract, working actively with researchers and local stakeholders, um, with other federal, state, local agencies, really trying to monitor what water quality is doing and you know, what we can do to, to help make it better as part of a bigger partnership. And lastly, we have um, fishing, diving, and other uses and reef resilience. So these, um, these fishing projects are really focused on engaging with stakeholders in that region of the reef that we focus on. So through workshops, through creating uh, management goals together, through co-creating research projects, uh, really focus on a lot of cooperation. And then reef resilience includes our citizen science program. So our CFAN umbrella program. So that includes things like marine debris cleanups, reef condition forecasting, um, Incident, report, incident reporting, and, and so on and so forth. And then lastly, our, um, our reef injury prevention and response program. So this can work closely with CFAN. So they lead the, the response, the assessment, and the restoration and, and mitigation efforts for uh, what we call non-permitted reef resource injuries. So if we have these big vessel, vessel groundings, if we have um, anchor drags, cable drags, plane crashes, um, so they're responsible for, uh, for working on, on remedying those things. So that's what we do. Um, so what can you guys do? So I've kind of broken this down into things you can do on the water, in the water, and then also just about everywhere. So first of all, if you're, if you're a boater, we have our, um, our Florida's Coral Reef locator. Map. So you can do this either on the app um, or you can do it on our desktop. So we are, we are working to reformat um, the app, but um, you can really easily find this um, by just um, going to our website or using this QR code. Um, so what this does is it helps you find where the reef is and where there's a sandy bottom. And so you can anchor you know, where the reef is not. And it also shows you where all of the mooring boys are because um, those are really also a great way to avoid anchoring on reefs. And so speaking of those mooring boys, we, we do work with our, our regional partners, oops, let me go back, our regional partners to make those really available and to keep those up to date. So pretty much any really well-known or any really good diving or fishing spot will have most likely several mooring boys. So they're super convenient if you wanna find a place to dive and also if you're already planning to go there, um, you know, you can use these mooring boys and it's really a lot easier than, than anchoring. And it's a lot better for the reef. And so if you're in the water, um, if you're snorkeling, if you're diving, you can report any, um, any incidents that you see to uh, CFAN, which is our Southeast Florida Action Network. So those incidents, um, pretty much anything. So if you see something um, that doesn't look like a healthy reef, um, even if it's fish, um, you see big pieces of marine debris, um, invasive species, you know, poor water quality, algae, just about anything, you can report that at cfan.net. And we also have a phone line that you can save um, if you're out in the water, you don't have access to Wi-Fi. So um, definitely do that. And as I said, we're hosting a class on that, um, you know, the, uh, the 19th or the 26th. Um, you can learn about those things in more detail. And I'm sure you guys have heard about sunscreen. So there are certain chemicals, um, you know, they're <laughs> written really small here, um, but it's pretty easy to find. Um, so certain chemicals in sunscreen, when they do enter the water, they can interfere with, uh, for example, reproductive cycles and not just of corals, but of, you know, a lot of, of other animals. So they can, something called bioaccumulation. So over time, as more and more of those pollutants enter the water and enter um, the tissue of an animal, if those animals can't get rid of those, those pollutants, then they build up and can be eventually harmful. So um, if you look for reef safe sunscreen, for example, there's a lot of great resources on this. And a cool thing about this is that 
it's not just if you're going in the ocean, but you know, even if you shower on land or things like that, that can eventually go into the sewers and you know, everything is, is connected. So that still affects the reef. So it's, it's always important. So if you're a gardener, um, really um, in terms of, you know, fertilizing, uh, you can do two things, you know, don't over fertilize. And then also when you do fertilize, try to do that when you're not going to have a lot of rain, because like I said, when you have a lot of rainfall, that's kind of like a big pulse that will carry those things um, more likely out onto the reef. So if you found that you have excess fertilizer and you have to fertilize your lawn or, or what have you, you can kind of sweep that up and store that away for later or dispose of it responsibly. And then also, um, it's also better for the, the plants, right? So if you water too much when you fertilize or the fertilizer, water too much when you fertilize, the fertilizer won't reach the roots. So it is a win-win. And then another thing for gardening, uh, most insects, you know, even though we might not like them, are actually, you know, either beneficial or harmless. So, um, you know, we just try to do the best we can to avoid those pesticides. Um, so, you know, here's a couple here that are actually quite beneficial. Um, but yeah, most of them are, are not too bad. So if you see a bug in your garden, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to use pesticide. So also something that absolutely everywhere um, in the world is effective is just looking for sustainable seafood. So if you're a restaurant, if you're in a store, um, you can look up where that fish is from. So you can look up the species and then um, if you ask like how it was caught or where it was caught, those two things together can really just help you track down if it's a sustainable choice. And sometimes just the species, just the kind of fish, it, it just may straight up never be sustainable. So um, one option is using uh, fishwatch.gov. Uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium also has a program. There's, there's a number that are really great for tracking those things down. And then another thing that you can do is, you know, just join a cleanup. So we have a lot of marine debris that accumulates on shore. So shore cleanups are obviously super important. Here in Florida, you know, every time the tide comes in, it seems like it brings in more stuff. So, you know, very satisfying to, to do a cleanup. Uh, and then we also host underwater reef cleanups as well as a couple other dive shops. So we'll be scheduling one for, for this, um, this summer eventually. Uh, so that's always really fun to go down and do a dive and, you know, bring a bag with you and then just pick up stuff you see on the reef. But if you want to just, you know, report if you're doing your own cleanups, there's something called the Clean Swell app. So you can just, you know, report what you're finding on there and then just put it into this bigger database so scientists can see what sort of debris we have in different places. And, uh, you know, going forward, we're relaunching our Florida's Coral Reef website, so you can stay up to date. We're going to be putting volunteer opportunities on it, news, so um, find even more ways to help the reef here. So with that, um, one last kind of little tip is that if you, if you can't or if you're not, you know, able to dive or go snorkeling, there is something very cool called the Coral City Camera, which you've probably heard of. Um, so this is like essentially like a live stream um, of a reef by Miami. So even if you can't dive or snorkel, um, you know, this is that fish is swimming on the reef right now. So it's kind of cool to see what's going on. So yes, um, with that, does anyone have any questions? Hey, Rachel. So we had um, some questions in the chat. So Someone asked, how do I keep the fire ants and palmetto bugs out of my house without insecticide? Um, I am not an entomologist, um, but from my personal experience, um, I think there's usually like a, a piece of food that they're going after, but I would say that um, there's probably some experts who can help you with that. Um, I think I mentioned it on the slide, but a really great resource that we have See if I mentioned it. Uh, no. So the the UF IFAS extension. So University of Florida um, has this IFAS group, which is um, works on agricultural and kind of like you know things that apply to the community. So they probably have some resources there 
um, on, on things that you can locally do because they're Florida based. Yeah, I would also personally say, um, I'm sure there are some home remedies online um, of different, you know, concoctions that people have made with yes. organic products um, that you can also go try. And then the next question is asking how our reefs did after the Biscayne Bay fish kill last fall in 2021. So that's a pretty recent event. So that's not something that I'm personally acquainted with. But if you wanted to email coral.dep.gov, I could connect you with our Biscayne Bay Aquatic Preserve. So they're the ones that are um, currently engaging with that. Um, and then we also have a meeting of the Biscayne Bay Commission this Friday. So um, you go to protectingfloridatogether.gov. You can see you can join in a webinar or submit your comments and questions there. So that's a group of, um, of county commissioners and a couple other agency leads who are who are in on that. So that's also a great group to ask your questions. Awesome. Uh, next question, one second, is what would you consider the main keystone species in South Florida coral reefs? Oof. Um, I mean, the concept of keystone species is kind of like a tough one to pin down. Um, I did look recently um, online to see if any had been identified. And for our reefs in particular, I couldn't find um, that any had. And so just for everyone, if you don't know what a keystone species is, um, that's a, a definition is that that's one species that, you know, if you took it away, would have a lot of wide ranging impacts. Um, but one thing I will say is that um, it kind of points that, you know, something like a coral reef, if you have animals um, who are, if you have, say, like at all different stages of a food web, if you have a lot of animals who are at each level. So, you know, if you have a lot of species of coral, if you have a lot of species of small fish, medium sized fish, a lot of species of shark, you know, it's kind of nice because, you know, if one of something happens to one of those, the rest of them are still around to fill that role. So, um, that might be why I couldn't personally find um, a paper to kind of share, share what that species would be. Awesome. Um, and then we have another question saying, hello, how would sustainable fishing, or what would sustainable fishing look like and what kind of fishing method is considered sustainable? Great question. So sustainable fishing actually generally does look like um, what's happening in Florida. So um, the state of Florida, as well as the states as a whole, you know, when we when we saw that, um, you know, you know, 50 years ago that there was um, unsustainable fishing happening, there were regulations that were put in place. So we've actually seen, um, like I know a number of shark species have rebounded, um, and other species I'm sure have seen the same thing. So sustainable fishing generally means that you know you're not taking more out of the ecosystem than can replenish itself. So there are a lot of scientists who are really, um, doing a lot to model what that looks like and then setting standards so that fishers don't take more than that. So in terms of what the, the best method is, you know, hook and line um, is generally, you know, thought of as quite sustainable, but it depends on where you are. Um, but, you know, generally I think hook and line is pretty safe. And also releasing fish that you catch if they're not, um, if you don't intend to eat. Awesome. Um, and then just ask me if we have any information on the new art artificial reef that's being implemented at Lauderdale by the sea. Right. Um, <clears throat> that is not in my wheelhouse, unfortunately. But again, if you want to email that to coral at floridadep.gov, um, I can try to connect you with someone who would know about that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah just, so I'll go to this next slide. Again, that to yeah. Yeah. Um, and then if you could go back to the Coral City camera again really quick, Rachel. Yeah. So someone asked if these corals on the camera were showing signs of bleaching. Um, if you want to take that one or I can also. Sure, yeah. Um, so these look like they're staghorn, maybe. I can't tell, but like, so the very tips of these, um, if I'm wrong, Taylor, that, like, it's like, um, that's where it's growing from. 
Exactly. Yeah, yeah. so a cropper palmata and a cropper cervicornis, it looks white on the ends of um, the branches because that's where new growth is starting. So yeah. So this think is, of like if you have a, a tree that's like budding in the spring, it's like the same kind of idea. So the, the budding part won't have like the full bark on it. It'll be kind of fresh and new. And that's kind of how you can think about those tips. Exactly. All right. Um, oh, we just had another one come in. Um, are there still efforts concerning artificially inducing warming resilience in corals in the lab? So I think that's asking, is there active research going on um, in producing resilient coral corals that have resistance right. to bleach? Yeah, great question. There is a ton of research. And so um, if you recall the stony coral tissue loss disease, so um, very soon after that started happening, a ton of partners kind of came together from, you know, research from local agencies, federal agencies, and that spawned a lot of research projects and, you know, focused on, of course, stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, so you know, we're forming, we're trying to work on corals that are more resilient to that disease. We've been able to do that by identifying certain, um, certain species of algae inside the coral, for instance, that are less likely to get the disease. Um, so that's one angle. Um, there are so also our labs that are working on uh, corals that are more resilient to warming, so to climate change, uh, to certain stressors like that. So absolutely great question there is a lot of active research there and another great thing about that is you know identifying those traits here in Florida because we have a great research program we can help you know other corals around the world um, kind of like identifying you know which things to watch out for and you know what to do to increase resilience exactly awesome well I think that is all for our questions and just to remind everyone I sent it out in the chat um, if you have any additional questions or you wanted more information on a topic, you can email coral at floridadep.gov. And I also sent the link to the Coral City camera so you can view it whenever you want. Thanks, Taylor. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, and you'll be able to find this as well as the other webinars at our um, on our website. Taylor, can you drop that link in the chat for the, for the Coral Reef um, webinar series? on the, yeah. the website yeah one second got you. um rachel do you mind scrolling back to where that link was present also um okay so i'll just type it in then you bet okay i think i remember Right, this one. So yeah, this is just like a short link um, that'll take you to where all the classes are and that's where we'll have the recordings as well. All right, well, thanks everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and I hope you learned something and uh, see you next time. <laughs>